everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I've got my producer, Joel, in the studio. And today we are covering one of my, I hate to say the word favorite, but definitely one of the most intriguing mysteries out there. And that is the Dyatlov Pass incident. I'm sure many of you have heard of this before. There's been a lot of coverage on it over the years, but it's one of those mysteries that is really still unsolved. I mean, there's a lot of theories out there as to what happened to this group of hikers out there in the Russian wilderness. And a lot of people believe it's something natural, but there are a lot of other theories that say otherwise, because the way that these poor hikers died is some of the most brutal injuries that I've, I've ever seen before and I just have a hard time believing that this was something purely natural that happened but then again you never know so that's what we're going to be diving into today on the podcast but before we get into things I wanted to talk about a couple things first of all thank you all for purchasing our new merch we really appreciate it it's almost sold out there are a few items left actually in a few sizes so if you wanted some of our Halloween merch collection go and get it while you can because once we're sold out I'm not entirely sure if we're going to be restocking anything, but with that being said, if there is an item on there that maybe you missed out on, what item would you like us to restock? Let us know in the comments or let us know on social media. We really appreciate it. Also, I wanted to remind you that my CBD company, Higher Love Wellness, is actually running a sale on all of our thousand milligram CBD oils. So if you've never checked out higherlovewellness.com before, Uh, It's my company. I own it 100% and we make some of the best CBD around. And right now, all of our thousand milligram oils are on sale. They're normally almost $100 and they're only $69.99. And basically you get a thousand milligrams of CBD contained within these oils, which is a very potent oil. And obviously CBD helps with a wide range of different things, mood, sleep. I mean, for me, it just helps take the edge off of my day without making me feel incapacitated or high or anything like that. So Definitely check it out. We'll be running that sale all month long. But before we get into things, I wanted to ask Joel something because (laughs) I was just traveling to LA last week. I was in LA for some work and on the plane, I got a chance to watch Hereditary. Oh, you did. Yeah, I watched Hereditary and I got to say, I know this is super random and and off topic, (laughs) but I just had to, to talk to him about this for a sec because this movie was like very different from other other horror films i've seen yeah, before absolutely and there were times that i wanted to just turn it off <laughs> because i was like this is dragging out way too yeah, long yeah but the overall story once you actually find out at the end what's actually happening it all makes sense right it was very very interesting yeah and, and intriguing i mean without spoiling anything it's it's a demonic possession film but it revolves around a family and their allegiance to a specific deity or demon. Yeah. And just the way that it was done. And some of the scenes were pretty cool. Like they were, you know, if you remember that one scene where the mom is like crawling on the wall, Oh, I know I was like, Holy shit. Like, and and I appreciated it. It wasn't like a bunch of jump scares, like a lot of horror movies that have just all jump scare, jump scare. And that's like the only thing in it. But this had like subtle, scares or like you'd be focusing on one character but then in the background something creepy was happening right or like just the lighting i think was really Uh done well was like creep the house that they lived in was super dark but then the tree house how there was always that light on and you never i'm like i from the beginning i was like what the fuck (laughs) is going on in the tree house it has like this orange glow yeah coming through the roof of it and i was just i was just waiting for like an operation just standing in the window at one point in the movie but there never was. Yeah, it was a a lot of people fucking hate that movie. Yeah. And I can see why. I mean, I feel like it's very drug out, but at the same time, I think it's very interesting. The storyline oh, yeah. is complex and like very really, complex. really makes you like rack your, your brain, you know, as to what's actually going on. Yeah. And like you said, at the very end is when you're like, oh, okay. This yeah. Makes I kind of like sense. how they do this like, grand reveal at the end where it yeah. all makes sense and you're like, oh, that's fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, demon movies are hard to to do yeah. well. And I think I think Hereditary did a decent job at the at the story. Yeah. I think the acting could have been a tad better. Sure. Maybe, but Oh, I know. I can't hear that the same anymore. 
<laughs> yeah now now when i hear that i just think of this movie but yeah. anyways well cool man i'm glad you got to see that on the plane and yeah uh, yeah. yeah and then there's a there's another film called the witch oh. that i believe is done by the same people that made that movie okay that is kind of similar-esque but i haven't seen it yet nice but it looks really good i meant to bring that up and, and another one made by the same creators is midsummer and and that movie's not even really scary it's just so fucked up that's all i can say <laughs> <laughs> i i mean it's good but at the same time i question like life during that movie like what the fuck yeah you know? yeah so, dude some movies i'm just like it's wacky whose twisted mind did this come right. out of because it's like how, how do they think put of these things, things together yeah but you know what? Like, I'm glad there's like people that are pushing, you know, kind of pushing the envelope. Cause I feel like mm -hmm. a lot of horror films could get very just repetitive. I mean, a lot of them do. They get repetitive, yeah. boring after a while. And you're just like, especially with seeing the, that, especially with the jump scares nowadays, you can almost predict when a jump scare is going right. to be. And it just totally. ruins the fun. Totally. And I appreciate movies that don't do that. Yeah. And yeah. use other ways. Or like, I find that atmosphere. If you do it right and you do the right music. Right. And Hereditary killed it with yes, the music. The music just kept this like tone throughout mm -hmm. the entire thing. And it just kept you in the zone. That's what yeah. I think was so good about it is it just kept me feeling like something could happen at any point. I agree. And things do happen. Uh -huh. But it's like spaced out enough that it's not predictable. Right. You don't really see any of it coming until it happens. And you're like, holy shit. <laughs> I was just sitting on the plane like, holy shit. Yeah. Can't it just happened. But very interesting, the whole con, you know, bringing, you know, sort of witchcraft and things like uh -huh. that into, a into like a ritual, yeah, ritualistic, you know, devil mm -hmm. worship type thing is very, very creepy to me. And just when you when it's done right in movies, I think it ends up being a really good, really entertaining film Absolutely. to watch. So that's the end of my <laughs> my rant on Hereditary. I just I just had to share those thoughts because I was just kind of blown away at the end of it. I was like, wow. I'm yeah. actually glad I watched this. So, well, let us know if you guys have seen it and your thoughts on it, and you know if there's any other movies out there that me and Josh that should based check on out. you know you kind of are starting to hear some of our tastes. I mean, my like Joel's been the only person that I could really watch <laughs> yeah. horror films with or like we've relate been late on it. Oh yeah, we've been doing that since we were kids, man. Yeah. Just posted up in the room watching ever. some really scary movies. I know, I know, and it's funny because we were. You know, we were extremely sheltered growing up, so that was never <laughs> something that was allowed. But as soon as we could we start watching, old, we were just like, let's do it. In. And we we're like, devil this, devil, sure, let's watch yeah. it. Like, and, and I think, and I don't know, sometimes I think, I don't know if any of you out there are like us, but I think sometimes, especially movies that have to do with hell demons, just have an extra bit of creepiness to it because of, you know, we we're raised very conservative Christian. Yeah. And so now watching that i think still like kind of tweaks a little bit of that like programmed fear that oh, we yeah, had from a young age does. where it just like it still creeps you out really oh, bad yeah. like more so like i can watch hack and slash and killer yeah, movies yeah. all day long it doesn't doesn't even phase me i mean i've i've seen so much that it just doesn't even do anything for me but it's the demonic ones that just always like kind of uh -huh. get, get my chest pumping and get i'm the like sweat going yeah. like yeah Oh, I agree. Yeah, so let us let us know if there's any others out there we should watch. But let's go ahead and dive into the Dyatlov Pass incident. So as a forewarning, there is a, definitely a lot of graphic detail to this, as I said at the beginning. But also, this was in Russia. So a lot of the names, or actually all the names, are Russian. And I'm going to do my very best to pronounce them correctly. Obviously, I'm not Russian in Russia and Russian is probably one of the hardest languages yeah. to speak, um, let alone pronunciate. So I'm going to do my best, but bear with me. But let's go ahead and dive into the Dyatlov Pass. In 1959, Igor Dyatlov dreamed of advancing his Soviet hiking certification to grade three. At 23 years old, he was an aspiring radio engineer and an excellent student at the Ural Polytechnic Institute. It was rumored he was even offered to take the position of deputy dean of faculty at his university. Alongside his engineering talents, he found a knack for cross-country hiking. So he assembled a team of 10 cross-country hikers, including himself, to join him on his journey. And many were friends or peers from school. One was even a woman he loved, Zenaida Kalmogorov, who was a popular fourth-year student at UPI. Her friends called her Zena. 
So the two of them got together a group of other very experienced mountaineers in order to try and attain the grade three certification together. So with a dose of inspiration, Igor Dyatlov took the initiative and mapped an advanced route through the Siberian wilderness along the Ural Mountains. The mountain range spans through Western Russia, running north and south, connecting the Arctic Ocean to Kazakhstan. The planned trail is about 200 miles long, and would mainly consist of skiing and hiking through the snowy terrain of the Urals. To prepare for the journey, Igor had also written his own dictionary of the Monsi language. The Monsi were the local indigenous people who lived in the areas they would be hiking through, and Igor had developed a strong respect for them over the years. They were hunters and fishermen, often spotted on the west side of the Ural Mountains, which was where Igor planned his trail. Along with his language preparations, he also designed and built a portable stove for excursions in the deep forest of Siberia. It could cook food and heat a tent from the inside, while an exhaust pipe ran out of a tent flap, and he was excited to bring his new project with them on the expedition. They also packed cross-country skis, shovels, an axe for chopping firewood, flashlights, cold weather gear, sleeping bags, and a large tent that all ten of them could sleep in. One of them even brought his mandolin to keep the group's spirits high. So once they had all their gear assembled and their maps ready, Dyatlov's group set out on January 23, 1959. From Sverdlovsk, they boarded a Soviet train and headed north towards the mountains. And on the morning of January 25th, the group reached the city of Ivedel. And from there, they took a bus to Vache, which was a small village to the north. This was their last contact with civilization before beginning their cross-country journey. They spent most of January 26 stocking up on food and gear, and luckily they knew the frigid temperatures of Siberia would keep most of their food from spoiling. They also spent their last night writing letters home to family and friends. Igor wrote to his friends telling them all about the long hike he was about to embark on, and he told them he would be back sometime between February 12th through the 15th. By the following day on January 27th, the team of 10 set out on their expedition, and from here on out it would be nothing but hiking and cross-country skiing. The last trace of civilization was behind them, and all that was ahead were the barren lands of western Siberia. Weathered mountaintops framed their horizons, and skinny trees packed the valleys in between. After only one day of hiking, one of the hikers, Yuri Yudin, complained of severe back pain. He had felt it growing in the last few days, but he thought he could push through. Yuri was a fourth-year student and had gone on intense hiking trips before, but due to a pinched sciatic nerve, he couldn't tolerate the pain anymore. Against his hopes of finally reaching grade 3 certification, Yuri Yudin decided to turn back. He was known for the positive energy he maintained in the group, and he had made good friends with another hiker named Lyudmila Dubania and many suspected there was a romance budding between them, as they had slept next to each other in the tent, but Yuri denied that there was any intimacy. In a diary entry, Lyud Mila wrote Yuri Yudin is going back home today. It is a pity, of course, to part with him, especially for Zina and me, but we can't do anything about it. With regret, Yuri took his leave and headed back towards Vache. The expedition continued on without him, now nine members strong. Over the next two days, the journey went on according to plan. The hikers took photos of their travels and documented each day in journals. The photos often showed them having a good time, smiling with each other or hiking through the wilderness. The first few days of the trip had been so easygoing. As Zina wrote in a group diary, I wonder what awaits us on this hike. Will anything new happen? By January 31st, they reached a wooded forest within the valley in which they camped. Knowing they would have to ascend a mountain slope the next day, they decided to take it easy and rest up. They made the camp an outpost for their journey back, so they stored food to lighten their load for the rest of the expedition. And the next day on February 1st, they headed out from camp and reached the foot of the mountain Kolat Siakul. The Monsi indigenous people called it Dead Mountain. The weather began to worsen throughout the day and the light snowfall of the morning had become a violent storm by the evening. February in Siberia was merciless, 
and the temperatures were far below freezing, near minus 19 degrees Fahrenheit as reported by the closest weather stations. Due to the storm, the crew was slightly off of their planned route, but Igor knew they could retrace their steps when the storm passed. It took them most of the day to make their way up the slope, and they eventually stopped to pitch their tent before nightfall. They dug into the slope of the mountain with shovels to make a flat landing for their tent, which they pitched several hundred feet from the peak of Dead Mountain and about a mile from the nearest tree line. The snow became blinding on the mountainside, and the visibility of the surrounding area dropped significantly. The biting winds forced them all into the tent for shelter, where they assembled Igor's stove for warmth. The final group journal entry of the day read, it is difficult to imagine such a comfort on the ridge, with shrill, howling wind hundreds of kilometers away from human settlements. But as time went on, weeks passed by, and their families back home hadn't seen or heard from the group of hikers. Friends of Igor recalled the letter he had sent them, claiming he would be back between the 12th and 15th of February. But those days came and went, and still there is no sign of the group. By February 20th, 28 days after the hikers had left on their cross-country trip, relatives of the crew demanded that a search party be put together. It didn't make sense that nine experienced hikers would be this delayed on their return. So family members, friends, volunteers, and students from the university formed a search party. And after several days of searching the trail, they came up with nothing because the group had set up camp off of their planned route. So police and the Soviet military joined the search. Planes, helicopters, and hounds searched the Ural Mountains, leaving no snowy stone unturned. But after six days of searching, on February 26th, they discovered the remains of the campsite. It rested on the slope of Dead Mountain, and by the look of it, something was obviously wrong. Only one tent pole stood, while the rest was in shambles, covered in snow and torn apart. A single ski stood at the other end where the tent once was propped up. Loose gear was scattered around the tent, including a flashlight and a broken ski pole. And the tent itself had been cut through several times with a knife from the inside. Beneath the remains of the tent, several jackets, boots, gloves, and other cold winter gear had been left inside. But what was weird was that there was no trace of the nine hikers. After circling the campsite, a trail of footsteps were found leading towards the far off tree line at the bottom of the slope. The search party took a night of rest, but by morning they followed the footprints towards the forest. They discovered nine sets and the imprints had left mild depressions in the snow. The casual footsteps suggested that the group walked down the mountain in a calm and orderly fashion instead of running. They followed the tracks for about 1,600 feet until the trail was lost, and the footprints disappeared into the snow. But since the trail had gone in a straight line, the search party figured the group had continued walking in a straight direction. After they traveled for about a mile from where the tent had been, they found the charred coals of a makeshift campfire beneath a giant cedar tree. Next to the freezing coals of the makeshift campfire, they found the frozen bodies of Yuri Doroshenko and Yuri Krivonyshenko. Their bodies were frozen statues lying in the snow and they had no jackets, pants, gloves, boots, or hats. All they wore were their underwear, shirts, and socks. They also didn't have any cold weather clothing on them or even near their bodies. Yuri K. was a recent graduate and close friend of Igor Dyatlov, and he had participated in all of his previous hikes, and he had hoped to have many more, but this had obviously been his last. His body was found lying face down, and it was completely frozen. Bruises covered his body, and the skin on the back of his hand was missing, and he suffered a burn mark on his left leg. According to the medical examiner, the official cause of death was hypothermia and fatigue. As for Yuri D., he was a brilliant fourth-year student who was about to graduate. When he was a child, his family had escaped German occupation, and he went on to become a straight-A student. 
He became good friends with Igor in school, and they found a similar passion for hiking soon after. They found Yuri D's body right beside the other, lying on his back, completely frozen. They also discovered a strange foam around his mouth, which some suspect might have been evidence of chest trauma. He also had burn marks on the right side of his head, possibly made by the nearby campfire or the stove in the tent. And again, the medical examiner ruled his cause of death was hypothermia. Because at the time of their death, it was estimated that the temperature was near minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. When they searched around the bodies, they noticed bark had been torn from the giant cedar tree, and several branches were freshly broken about 15 feet up the trunk, as if someone had tried to climb it. Maybe this person climbed the tree to see their way back to camp, or to hide from someone, or something. Or maybe it was to see where the others had gone, but no one knows for sure. As for the others, days passed, and even weeks dragged on. Three more hikers were eventually discovered at various places between the big cedar tree and the original tent location. Partially buried under two inches of snow, each body was spaced out in a line, and each one faced the tent as if they were trying to make it back to their campsite. They wore more winter gear than the first two that had been found, but they were still missing boots, hats, and gloves. One of the three discovered was Igor Dyatlov, the group's leader, who was found about a thousand feet away from the cedar tree. He lay on his back with his arms curled towards his chest. He wore an unbuttoned fur coat, a sweater, and a long-sleeved shirt. And later it was discovered that this long-sleeved shirt belonged to Yuri D., He needed to fight the frigid temperatures if he was going to make it back to camp, but Igor had been unsuccessful, and he too had died from hypothermia, and his brain had begun to swell, which is a common symptom of hypothermia that can cause convulsions before death. The closest hiker to make it towards the camp was Igor's girlfriend, Zina. She had previously gone on six major trips before her last, and she was popular among her friends as she was known for her strength and determination. On one of her previous trips, she had been bitten by a poisonous viper, but survived. On the last trip, her strength was no different, but it wasn't enough. She had made it over 2,000 feet from the cedar tree, two times farther than Igor. She wore several layers of clothing, socks, and hats, but it still wasn't enough. She fell to the snow and curled up on her right side, Her brain swelled the same as Igor's, and she violently convulsed before death. The official cause again was determined to be hypothermia. The third person found in between the cedar tree and the tent was Rustam Slobodin, a recent graduate and veteran hiker who had many long-distance hikes under his belt. Rustam often played the mandolin to keep camp spirits high, and his instrument was later found in the tent beside the cold winter gear. Along with his musical talents, he was one of the strongest of the group, but he only made it a few hundred feet from Igor. When the medical examiner inspected his body, he discovered a fracture in his skull that looked like it could have come from a blunt object. Another injury suggests that he might have died while standing up even. But again, his official cause of death was reported to be hypothermia. Of the first five bodies to be found, some say that four of them had been drunk on the night of the incident, but others later reported a mistranslation in the medical report from Russian to English. It would be much easier to explain the hikers' mysterious motivations if they had just been drunk, but this wasn't the case. Still, all of the first five hikers have been discovered with several minor injuries across their bodies, whether it was bruises, cuts, scrapes, and burns. They were covered in them. But again, hypothermia was their official cause of death. And despite these injuries, none compared to the violent trauma of the last four bodies discovered by the search party. Known as the last four, or four in the creek, the last hikers were found on the opposite side of the cedar tree, just down the slope of Dead Mountain, but in the opposite direction of camp. It took almost two months of intense searching to find all nine hikers, and more than ten feet of snow concealed the last four. In the warming month of April, the snow had begun to melt, 
which formed a small stream of water within the ravine. And unlike the frozen stiff bodies of the first five, perfectly preserved in the Siberian frost, the last four had begun decomposing as the warm weather came. And unlike the others, three of the four sustained lethal injuries to the chest and head. Alexander Kolevatov's body was found among them. Alexander was an experienced hiker who had previously gone on several hikes in the northern Ural Mountains. He was also known to keep a private journal with him, but this was never recovered. There's not much information on the position of his body, but part of his skull was exposed, and he had an injury behind his ear, and his neck was deformed in a crooked position. His official cause of death was hypothermia. Also in the ravine was the body of Nikolai Thibo Brennol. Nikolai was the son of a French communist who had been executed by Stalin, and he was born in a Soviet concentration camp for political prisoners. He was eventually set free and went to school to become an engineer. And there is where he met Igor and his crew, and he became interested in cross-country hiking. Just before leaving with Igor and his crew, Nikolai promised his mother that this hike would be his last. Again, not much is known about the position of his body, but the medical examiner reported that the entire right side of his skull had been obliterated. Multiple fractures stemmed from behind his right ear, and one of the fractures wrapped to the front of his forehead. The official cause of death for him was traumatic internal injury. Nearby, Alexander, Lyuta was found face down in the mud of the ravine, although evidence suggests that her body might have been moved after death. Lyuta was a three-year engineering student and an avid hiker. She was the group leader of a previous grade two hike through the northern Urals where she was accidentally shot by another hiker who was cleaning his rifle. She hoped that this was the worst thing to happen on her hikes. And after recovering from her injury, she was ready for more cross-country excursions. But little did she know, that gunshot wound was the least of her worries. Lyuta's chest was found completely crushed. Ten of her ribs had been broken and separated, and her heart was smashed inside of it. Her nose was pushed into her skull, and her jaw was wrenched open in a screaming position. Her upper lip was gone, revealing her teeth, and both of her eyes and her tongue were just missing. About three and a half ounces of blood filled her stomach, suggesting that she was still alive when her tongue was removed. The official cause of death was hemorrhaging into the heart's right atrium, multiple fractured ribs, and internal bleeding. The last of the nine hikers was a man by the name of Alexander Zolotarev. He was the oldest and most mysterious of the group. At 37 years old, he was much older than everybody else, who were all in their early 20s. By coincidence, he would celebrate his birthday on February 2nd, the day after the incident. It was rare that a 37-year-old man was even around during the late 50s because the survival rate for his generation that fought in World War II was only 3%. He was a decorated soldier who served on the Eastern Front during the war, and he might have been in the Special Forces. But much of his past remains a mystery. The group knew him as Alexander, but it was later revealed that his true name was Semyon. And upon his death, his family was surprised to see that his body was covered in military tattoos and mysterious symbols. Both Semyon and Alexander Kolotov's bodies were found holding each other to keep warm in their final moments. Around Semyon's neck, investigators discovered a photo camera that had survived the running water in the ravine for months. These pictures were later developed, and the last photo, known as Frame 34, shows a blurred image of lights surrounded by darkness. Many believe this photo was taken on the night of the incident, and Semyon was trying to reveal a piece of what had happened on that night. Semyon's rib cage had been completely smashed, just like Leuda's. Something massive had broken five of his ribs on the right side, and he also had an injury to his head. He also had gaping eye sockets where his eyes were clearly missing, and parts of his skull were visible through his skin. The official cause of his death was traumatic internal injury. The medical examiner believed that the traumatic injuries of the last three were from a fall. He compared the intensity to a violent car crash or the shockwave of an explosion. He also believed that the lethal injuries had occurred when they were all still alive 
and denied that another person could have inflicted the wounds. The scope of the damage was too immense to have been caused by the hands of someone else, or even a weapon. One of the last mysterious pieces of evidence for the four in the creek was that two of them were found wearing clothing that had significant traces of radioactivity. Alexander Kolevatov wore radioactive pants and a jacket, and Lyuda wore a radioactive jacket as well. Despite this huge mystery, the criminal investigation ended on May 28th. The Soviet government had shut the investigation down due to an absence of a guilty party. They deemed that since there was no murder involved, there was no longer a need for a criminal investigation. The families of the victims were given the following conclusion by the lead investigator, Lev Ivanov. Quote, the cause of death was an unknown compelling force which the hikers were unable to overcome. After this, the Soviet government then quickly sealed the case. And because of such an abrupt ending for a case that raised so many questions, endless theories began to rise, and many of the families wanted real answers. In the end, sealing the case early caused the case to get more attention than ever. And to this day, after half a century, after the Dyatlov Pass incident, people are still seeking answers to so many questions. Why did they cut their way out of the tent from the inside? Why did they not take proper gear out of the tent with them? Why did they climb a tree? Why did they leave makeshift fire and head back to camp? Why were some found without clothes? Why did some have burn marks on their skin? Why did some have the gaping eye sockets or no tongue? Why did some have cracked skulls and smashed ribs? And why did two wear radioactive clothing? The questions span far and wide, and the theories surrounding the incident span even farther and wider. Some people propose the theories of giant radioactive alien spaceship, an avalanche, the KGB, a wandering Siberian Yeti, infrasounds, violent winds, a faulty stove, and Soviet rocket experiments to list a few. But before we try to break down each of these questions and examine each of the theories, we're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. And we'll be right back. Today's episode is brought to you by Honey. We all shop online and we've all seen that promo code field that taunts us at checkout. But thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is a free browser extension that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online and they range from sites that have tech and gaming products to popular fashion brands and even food delivery. So imagine you're shopping at one of your favorite sites, and when you check out, the Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site, and boom, watch that coupon work and see the prices drop. Recently, I was shopping for new clothes for LA, and at checkout, I was actually kind of astounded at what kind of cart total I'd racked up. But then I was overjoyed to see the honey button drop down and I hit apply and it found me a 20% off coupon. And this was like hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of clothes. So it's literally saved me a hundred plus dollars on my purchase. Not only has honey found me tons of savings in my online purchases, but it's found it's over 17 million members, over $2 billion in savings. So if you don't already have honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash lights out. That's joinhoney.com slash lights out. A gift that I received that keeps on giving are my Raycon wireless earbuds. I use these all of the time, whether it's going to the gym or using them on my airplane ride. With seamless Bluetooth pairing and a comfortable noise isolating fit, you can start listening right away and keep listening for hours. The audio quality is amazing, and I'm not just saying that. It's comparable to what you get from other premium brands, except Raycon starts at half the price. The new everyday earbuds come with three new sound profiles to make sure everything you're listening to sounds its best with just the right amount of bass. There's pure mode for podcast listening or blues or instrumental music. You can use balance, which is great for both podcast listening as well as rock or heavy metal. And then there's bass mode for all you bass heads out there that listen to hip hop, maybe some dubstep, some EDM, some reggae. Bass mode sounds absolutely amazing. 
Raycon offers eight hours of play time and a 32 hour battery life, which is super nice. So it doesn't really matter how long your trip is. You can make sure you can have your earbuds at all times. There's also a built in mic so you can take calls on your earbuds at the press of a button. So this holiday season, either treat yourself to some Raycon wireless earbuds or get them for someone else. They make for a great gift. So go to buyraycon.com slash lights out today to unlock exclusive deals up to 20% off your Raycon order. But hurry, this offer is available for a limited time only and you don't want to miss it. That's buyraycon.com slash lights out to unlock up to 20% off your Raycons. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash lights out. And our last sponsor for today is Talkspace. The people around us make a huge impact on our lives and life's pressures can cause those relationships to change for better or for worse. Whether you're having complicated feelings about a relationship or you just need a neutral person to talk to, Talkspace Online Therapy connects you to a licensed professional to help you work through it. And that's me. I have tons of people I can talk to in my life, but sometimes I just need that third party to talk to to get a neutral perspective on any sort of situation I'm in and it always helps immensely in trying to figure out where my head's at. Talkspace is ready to help you start feeling better with a single message. You can set goals with your Talkspace therapist and develop techniques to cope in difficult times. Talkspace offers individual therapy, couples therapy, and medication prescription services, which is super helpful, especially if you're somebody who travels and maybe you're not able to get in to see a local therapist. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform, and there are thousands of licensed therapists available for you to match with across dozens of specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationships, and more. Talkspace works around your schedule at your convenience with live video sessions and unlimited messages with your dedicated therapist, because sometimes you don't need a big, long session. You just need to send a couple messages to get some clarification. Well, Talkspace can take care of that for you. If you need a little support to help you through the end of the year, or you want to start building towards a better upcoming year, Talkspace is here to help. Match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month with the promo code LIGHTSOUT. That's $100 off when you use code LIGHTSOUT at Talkspace.com. So let's talk about some of the theories here about what may have happened to these hikers. And we'll start with the easiest. Why were the two hikers near the campfire nearly naked? Well, some suggest that it might have been an example of paradoxical undressing. It's a phenomenon that is commonly seen in cases of lethal hypothermia. When someone begins freezing to death, sometimes their nerves within the vessel walls become paralyzed, or the network in their brain that usually senses cold temperatures begins short-circuiting. So they can no longer sense the freezing temperatures, and instead they start feeling an intense warmth. And sometimes this warm feeling gets so intense that the person begins stripping their clothes down in order to cool themselves off. While this may have been the case for the two Yuris found beside the makeshift fire, there might be a more straightforward, less dramatic explanation. It was later discovered that Igor was wearing one of the men's long sleeve shirts, and Lyuda was wearing the other man's coat. So the other hikers most likely took the men's clothing after they died. The entire group had been severely underdressed for the weather, so it would make sense that the rest would do anything they could in order to stay warm and stay alive. Some have noted that a few pieces of clothing that the others wore had been cut with a knife. Some theories suggest that both the men's bodies and clothes began to quickly freeze after they died, and their bodies became stiff. So Igor and Lyuta had to cut the clothes off with a knife. As for the more horrific evidence discovered, Many can't get over the grisly state of Lyuta's body. The missing eyes and tongue suggest something more sinister might have been at play. Some say that the eyes and tongue had been eaten by scavenging birds of Siberia, while others argue that they were cut or ripped out, especially the tongue. The only thing in the medical report that mentions the tongue is a brief statement that says, the diaphragm of the mouth and tongue is missing. And that's all the medical examiner had to say about it. So if it was something more explainable, why didn't the medical examiner note that in his report? As for the eyes, he wrote gaping orbits. The eyeballs are absent. The theories that claim her tongue had been cut out point to the three and a half ounces of blood found in her stomach. This could have been from trauma in her mouth that she eventually swallowed. But in reality, the examiner never mentioned blood, which might have been lost in translation. 
The report reads the stomach contained up to 100 cubic centimeters of dark red slimy mass. He doesn't once use the word blood. It could have been food mixed with a small amount of blood, or something else entirely. It also wouldn't be strange to find blood in her stomach since she suffered from massive internal bleeding from her chest cavity being pulverized. As for why the eyes and tongue were missing entirely, the examiner report goes on to say, soft tissue injuries to the head, postmortem changes, putrefaction and decomposition to Lyuda's corpse, which was recently exposed to water prior to detection. In other words, the bodies in the ravine had begun to decompose, and they were found months after the others, when the weather started to warm up. The snow began to melt and the ravine filled up with running water. All of the last four bodies were damaged by the melting snow. And since Lyuda had been found face down in the ravine, it was most likely that the constant flow of water contributed to the decomposition of her face, eyes, lips, and tongue. But as for the radioactive coat she was wearing, things got a bit more complicated. Three separate pieces of clothing were radioactive on two of the bodies found in the ravine, including a pair of pants and two shirts. Some claim that the bodies found in the ravine had an ominous glow around their skin, and their hair had turned a brighter color. But that may have just been from the decomposition. This has had many people theorizing that some sort of Soviet experimentation was at work, even theories of radioactive aliens began taking shape. Throughout the hike, three Soviet soldiers and two separate hiking groups claimed to have seen UFOs near the mountains where Dyatlov's group had been hiking. They came in the form of orbs of light moving across the night sky for a few seconds, and sometimes up to several minutes. Many alleged that the last picture taken by Semyon's camera, frame 34, was a picture of a spaceship but the picture is far too blurry to conclude anything for certain. Later, it was only revealed that only one of the hiking groups claimed to have seen a UFO on the night of the incident. Some alien enthusiasts theorize that aliens used a radioactive gravity fluctuation weapon that pulled the hikers from the ground and threw them out of their tent. After the initial blast of the weapon, three of them had died from their injuries, and the rest panicked and fled towards the woods, later dying of hypothermia. Other theorists believe that the KGB, the Soviet Union's security agency, had threatened alien researchers and demanded they seize all research on alien interference during the incident. Some even say that the aliens killed the researchers because they didn't want to be discovered. But many argue that the UFOs weren't aliens at all. In fact, they were actually Soviet aircraft, or nuclear missiles being tested. Although no hunks of metal or shrapnel were ever reported at the scene, Many believe the hikers were just at the wrong place at the wrong time, in an area where the Soviet government had been testing various weapons, like parachute mines. A parachute mine was a common World War II missile dropped from an airplane that landed with the help of a parachute. Some report that the areas near the Ural Mountains have been used for parachute mine testing, and many believe that the three hikers killed by lethal injuries had died from the first parachute mine dropped in the area. And when the rest woke up, Due to the explosion, they cut their way out of the tent in a panic and fled down the mountainside. Another theory which would explain the levels of radiation suggests that the Soviets were testing their R-12 thermonuclear rockets. And after they realized the hikers had crossed into a private testing area, they were executed. This was a strongly held belief by Yuri Yudin, who if you remember was the hiker who left the expedition early due to severe back pain. He had constantly criticized the official criminal investigation of Dyatlov Pass for decades. He believed the incident was a series of murders carried out by the KGB, or Soviet Special Forces, or they allowed Western spies to kill the group. It was known that the Soviet military had been conducting R-12 rocket tests in the Ural Mountain regions before their official use in March of 1959. Apparently not all of the tests were successful, but again, search teams found no trace of metal or impact zones. Also, the dean of the Hikers University had submitted the map of the planned trip to Soviet officials, so they could have easily changed the course of the expedition if they knew they were traveling close to a testing area. Plus, it was known that any Soviet facility was often guarded by a wall or a fence at the time. Some argue, though, that the testing area hadn't been closed off, and that one of the group members, Semyon, who was an ex-Special Forces veteran, attacked the group 
after they enter the area. They often point to the autopsy of Rustam Slobodin, the one who died on his way back to the tent. The reports showed that he had a fracture in his skull that might have been from someone swinging a blunt object at his head. And after some digging into the search party reports, the theory of Soviet Special Forces' involvement ignited with the discovery of putes. Putes were thin linen cloths that were wrapped around soldiers' boots. They were common in the 30s, but some say that the old school Special Forces might have still worn them in the 50s. It would have been unlikely that any of the hikers wore them, except for Semyon. The putes were only reported on the rescue party's radiogram, but never noted in the final report. And still, none of the members of the rescue party reported any more footprints besides the original nine. Since the Dyatlov group didn't have any shoes on, their footprints were easily recognizable. But Yuri Yudin, the one who initially left the group, had returned to study the scene. Yuri was an experienced tracker and his peers considered him a mountain man, someone familiar with the Siberian snow. Supposedly, there had been evidence of a boot print but later they realized a single boot had been found on Rustam's right foot. As suspicious as some of the evidence sounds, questions have been left unanswered. Why wouldn't the Soviet government simply remove the bodies from the scene? And why would they let almost anyone search the area if they had something to hide? And after all of this, the question still remains. Why were two of the hikers wearing clothing contaminated with radiation? Radiological studies say that under normal circumstances, an area of 150 centimeters squared, or roughly 60 inches squared, should not exceed 5,000 disintegrations per minute. And when the clothing was tested, the pair of pants had 5,000 dpm, one shirt had 5,600 dpm, and the other had 9,900 dpm. So all three had a significant amount of radiation. The official explanation in the report said, that the clothes were contaminated as radioactive dust fell from the atmosphere, or that the clothes were susceptible to contamination when in contact with radioactive substances. But they couldn't say exactly how the clothes were actually contaminated. They figured it could have been the result of natural radioactivity in the air. But I beg to differ. One theory suggests that it was from two of the hikers' previous contact with nuclear materials. Alexander Kolotov, The one who was found dead from hypothermia in the ravine had moved to Moscow in 1953 and worked in a secret institute of the Ministry of Medium Machine Building. The project was only known by its serial number, I-3394. The institute was known for researching materials used in the nuclear industry, and Alexander eventually moved over to the Research Institute of Inorganic Materials that also dealt with nuclear material. So this could explain why his clothing had radioactivity present. Another one of the hikers, Yuri K., one of the men found beneath the cedar tree had also worked at a top-secret plutonium production plant for nuclear weapons, called Chelyabinsk-40. This secret nuclear facility experienced a disaster where on September 29, 1957, the plutonium plant experienced a radioactive leak, and Yuri had been one of the people sent to clean up the mess. Although he most likely wouldn't have kept these clothes since he had a better understanding of radioactivity than most, the nuclear facility where he worked was considered one of the most contaminated places on Earth. And radioactive material is known to spread far and wide. So whether the radioactivity was from aliens, Soviet missile testing, or previous work with nuclear material, we'll never know the true answer. But it's probably safe to say that in the 1950s Soviet Union, When the space race and the Cold War were at an all-time high, missiles, rockets, and spacecrafts riddled the sky, and radioactivity was probably almost as common as snow. But one of the most puzzling and confusing pieces to the Dyatlov Pass incident is why the group decided to leave the tent in the first place, and to add to that, why did they leave the tent by cutting through it from the inside? According to the watches found on a few of the hikers, they left the tent between 1.30 and 5.30 a.m., and they died between 4.30 and 7.30 a.m. Tons of speculation surrounds this decision, but a few things can be assumed. The tent flaps were possibly blocked, or something made them panic and slash through the canvas. They also left behind most of their gear, which suggests they left in a hurry. 
but the slow and deliberate footprints found outside the tent make it seem like they weren't in too much of a hurry at all. Not much of the evidence makes sense, but several theories have gained attention over the years. Maybe a Siberian, Yeti, had charged the tent. Or the Monsi people didn't like trespassers. But again, no other footprints were found, and the Monsi people weren't known to be violent to hikers in the Ural Mountains. One simple theory tells of a time traveler. They so desperately wanted to figure out the mystery of Dyatlov Pass that they traveled back in time to see for themselves. Maybe they peered out of thin air naked in the middle of the tent, and when the hikers woke up seeing a naked time traveler in their tent, they freaked out, slashed their way out of the tent, and fled down the mountainside eventually succumbing to the cold forces of Siberia. The time traveler ironically caused them to die while trying to find out how they died. And so the endless time travel paradox continues on forever. Another theory talks about infrasonic winds causing a frenzy. In the book Dead Mountain, published in 2013, Donnie Richard puts together the idea that infrasound caused the group to freak out. The idea was that a strong wind came down the mountainside and created a vortex, that became so violent that it produced a sonic wave that had a low frequency that couldn't be heard by human ears. But this frequency caused immediate hysteria within the group, although they couldn't figure out why, since they couldn't hear it. As the mass hysteria escalated, they began cutting through the tent, thinking that they were in some sort of danger, in which they then wandered out into the woods. At some point, they got out of range of the infrasound, once they reached a tree line, and they finally returned to their senses, but by that time it was too late, as they had stranded themselves too far from camp with not enough gear to protect them from nature. Another theory has come together surrounding Igor Dyatlov's stove, which again, the stove was a homemade design that Igor built himself. It had been tested before the trip, and he was confident they could use it effectively on their hike. After the search party found the tent, they found traces of fried ham and bacon inside the tent, which suggested that they used the stove on the night of the incident. They disassembled the stove before going to sleep, but the leftover embers might have somehow reignited as they slept, causing a fire within the tent. Smoke started billowing from the reignited embers, causing the hikers to begin suffocating, so this could explain why they needed to cut the tent from the inside. They needed to immediately vent the smoke out of the tent so they wouldn't die. Or in a state of panic, they might have cut the tent to escape the fumes. Both of the men found beneath the cedar tree had burn marks on them. One was burned on the leg and the other was burned on the head. These might have been from the makeshift fire, or they could have been from the stove embers. Four of the hikers also had blood found on or around their mouths, and coughing up blood could be a sign of smoke inhalation. Added onto this, a suspicious photo was found in the group's collection that showed one of the hikers wearing a jacket covered in burn marks. Could this have been from just another fire mishap, or had the stove been causing problems throughout the whole trip? Could it have been bad enough for them to cut their way through the tent? One theory disregards the tent cutting entirely. Richard Holmgren, a Swedish archaeologist, proposed a different idea. In February 2019, 60 years after the Dyatlov Pass incident, he went out to the area where the hiker's tent was found. He wanted to recreate the camp out and see for himself what could have killed the hikers. He proposed a theory that catabatic winds are what forced the hikers from their tent. They had traveled through the day of heavy snow and by night the winds had picked up. A catabatic wind, also known as a falling wind, gained speed as it traveled down a mountainside under the force of gravity. Catabatic winds have the potential to create hurricane-like conditions that could have ripped the tent to shreds. So the tent might not have been cut through, but torn by the force of nature. While camping, Richard also experienced freezing temperatures and his clothes became rock solid while inside his own tent. So that could explain why the hikers couldn't grab their gear immediately, as their clothes were frozen stiff. After the winds destroyed their tent, the hikers fled the slope, poorly dressed and disoriented, and they made their way towards the tree line in hopes of avoiding more violent winds. So now that we have some ideas of why they would have fled the tent, we still don't know precisely how they died. Richard Holmgren believes that after making it to the tree line, they built a makeshift fire and began planning their survival. The two Yuris were told to stay by the fire while three tried to head back for the gear inside the tent. 
The last four then headed deeper into the woods to try and build a snow shelter to survive the violent snowstorm. The four that ran deeper into the woods triggered an avalanche that collided down the mountain, carried their bodies all the way to the ravine where it dropped them 10 feet down and crushed three of them to death instantly. Or if they weren't crushed immediately, maybe they successfully built a snow shelter, but it collapsed on top of them. Then over the early months of spring, the several feet of snow melted and weighed down on the bodies in the ravine, crushing their skulls and chests in the process, and the rest died from being buried beneath the avalanche. But some argue that it couldn't have been an avalanche. Usually people don't die from hypothermia when buried by snow. They die from asphyxiation because the snow cuts off their access to oxygen. People also argue that the hikers were too experienced to set up a camp on the mountainside prone to avalanches unless they were purposely trying to challenge themselves. But a study published in 2021 revisited the idea of an avalanche. A man named Johan Gom, a snow scientist, and his colleague Alexander Puzrin took another shot at the avalanche theory. This is what they called the delayed slab theory. A delayed slab avalanche isn't like your typical avalanche. It forms when a heavy concentration of snow forms above a weaker layer of snow, and the earliest snow of the winter falls on the warmer ground, creating a more fragile layer of snow that's 80% air. And as winter continues, the snow that falls on top of this layer is much denser. And when the weak layer fails, it releases the heavier concentrated layer. Think of two books, one on top of the other. When they're tilted, the top one begins to slide first. The hikers had set up their tent on a 23 degree incline, and many argue that it takes about 30 degrees to trigger an avalanche. But a slab avalanche doesn't need 30 degrees. It only needs a significant amount of weight on the topmost layer. They most likely cut through the weakest layer of snow when they pitch the tent, as seen in the last photograph of the hikers on the mountainside. And this immediately started a countdown towards their demise. And as the night went on, the strong catabatic winds increased in force, and as the snow fell, it built a heavier layer on top. And this contributed to the failure of the weaker layer beneath. And once the weight was too much for the weakest layer to bear, the slab avalanche was released. When the avalanche began, it may have crushed part of the tent, causing severe injuries to the three as they slept. This would also explain why they panicked and cut through the side of the tent. The three might not have died immediately, and the others could have pulled them from the snow. Although most avalanches are seen to be massive, the slab avalanche could have been no bigger than 16 feet by 16 feet, but still have done considerable damage. So although the delayed slab theory makes sense, certain things might never be explained. With nothing left behind by the hikers, we might never understand their motivations for why they did what they did. The truth lies with them. Why did they travel over half a mile down the mountain? Were some trying to reach the old camp outpost they had made the day before? Why did they try to climb the tree? Why did they split up? We might never know. After their bodies were returned to their families, seven hikers were buried in St. Michael Cemetery in Russia. A stone pillar was built in their honor where their names and pictures are on display. On February 2nd of every year, the anniversary of the incident, Yuri Yudin, the hiker who turned back early, visits the cemetery every year. He believes he should have been with them, and it's always hard for him to deal with that day. But Yuri Yudin has continued to be one of the most prominent voices trying to uncover the truth of what happened to his friends. But on April 27, 2013, he passed away and was buried with his friends in St. Michael's Cemetery. But for his entire life, he kept a toy bear that was given to him by Layuda just before he left the expedition all those years back in 1959. So when looking at the Dyalov Pass incident as a whole, it's very clear that there's a lot of different things that could have happened. But I want to ask you, Joel, what do you think happened? Out of all these series, what, what really resonated with you? What do you think is the most likely scenario? I mean, first off, such a wild story. It is. I mean, so much stuff going on in this. Um, in my opinion, I think this is a combination of things that happened to these hikers. Um, what I think how it started was they were hiking. The weather was just getting absolutely terrible, cold wind was unbearable so they decided to set up their tent and 
get a fire going, you know, see if they can wait it out. Uh, but then it just kept getting worse and worse. And tying into that avalanche theory, there could have been some snow that was starting to like slide onto their tent or shifting the ground. So the slab, the avalanche, the slab avalanche theory makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And with the whole radioactive, you know, uh, stuff that they found there, it makes what I think is that being like a bombing testing site, there could have just been, you know, debris or contaminated soil within that ground that when the avalanche occurred, it just kind of dispersed all of that. So that could explain why there was radioactivity. You yeah, know, that's a, that's there. a good point. I, I think it seems very likely that there's probably just radioactivity all over the mountains there because of the military test sites. And I think also, you know, figuring out that a lot of them actually worked very closely in radioactive, you know, institutes and on, doing research on on different things prior to hiking. I think, I mean, radioactivity hangs with you yeah, for a, a long, long time. long time. I mean, it's like, it's very hard to like completely get rid of it. So it would make sense that there would be some radioactivity. And it was also like, so here's the thing, like, when you think about the the alien ufo theory i think if that were the case i think those numbers would have been way higher because like both were kind of like slightly elevated to make note of but then like nothing else and just one of them like there were all of them would have had mass amounts of radioactivity detected on all their clothing but it was just certain you know certain hikers so and looking at their injuries though a lot of them suffered you know, like skull damage or just right. broken bones. What do you think like, that's from? I think it's from the possible avalanche of them falling, sure. hitting rocks, falling oh, yeah. off the ravine. It's a mountain. <laughs> yeah, and then how they found, you know, one of the hikers without their eyes and stuff. I think that was over time after the fact of yeah. decomposing. I mean, there's animals out on the mountains. Right, right. Stuff totally. like that. So I don't think it was necessarily aliens or like somebody trying to ambush them or kill them. I um, think this was like an accident, like a natural yeah, disaster. Yeah, I think it was a, a natural disaster and just kind of multiple things happening at once and just kind of one thing after the other led to their their deaths. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I've looked at this this story several times and and, you know, my thoughts about it have changed quite a bit. But when you actually look into the science of everything, I think a lot of it makes sense. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that some claim to have seen orbs and things like that. I think maybe there is some truth to that because of the military testing that's happening up there. Is it possible that they did run across, you know, an area that they weren't supposed to be in? And and what if perhaps something was shot at the side of the mountain that just was never recovered that triggered the avalanche? Mm-hmm. You know, like, was it just like KGB agents that came and executed them? No. That the, there would be no honestly, they probably would have just disappeared at that point if it was yeah. like secret, you know, government shit going on and they got caught being in the wrong area. I think yeah. we would have never found their bodies. Right. It seems to me like either something triggered the avalanche and a real full blown avalanche happened, but then again, there'd probably been more evidence of that. But I mean, we're talking a lot of time passing before right. they actually got up there. So a lot of the evidence, you know, an avalanche could just look like you know if more snow falls i mean it's very easy to cover up the evidence of an avalanche because for me the the fact that two of them tried to climb trees and they like scratched the shit out of the side of the tree trying to climb it that's tells me that something was coming down the mountain most likely or chasing them Mm -hmm. down the mountain but and they're trying to get high above it to avoid being hit by snow or something yeah but to me maybe while they were experiencing hypothermia type symptoms i mean they're going to be hallucinating yeah, there's going to no, be lots true. of things i mean who knows they those orbs that they were seeing or just could have just been it could have just all been in their head and then you know it probably got to them to a point of being paranoid that there was something after them and that's why they, they climbed the tree or yeah you know, yeah. something like that. Totally. I mean, there's a lot of things in, that could have happened. I think a lot of people, you know, really get tripped up on is the injuries part of it. The eyes gouged out, tongue missing and stuff. And I think most likely scenario is the decomposition and, you know, their bodies were wet. I mean, as the snow melts, it's going to just expedite decomposition. And that's all soft tissue, too. So, yeah. like, animals and scavengers go for those things first because right. it's like, probably the only thing that's still you know easily 
you know, plucked yeah. from the body. So it would make sense that a lot of those, you know, fleshier parts would be gone. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's fun to run wild with the theories. It it's is. fun to theorize about aliens, this and, you know, or a Yeti attacking right. them or something. But I just think that there's too much environmental factors that really just make sense for this. And mm -hmm. especially knowing, you know, the hikers backgrounds as well as just looking at all of the physical evidence. I think as far as the tent being cut from the inside out could have been because of the stove. I still mm -hmm. think that your um, Igor stove may have malfunctioned mm -hmm. and perhaps filled the the tent with yeah, smoke right. i think that's a very real possibility and that's why they didn't grab their stuff initially when they ran out because they're like gotta Shit, we gotta get out like, yeah we, we gotta, gotta get out. like cut holes in the tent uh -huh. and then something caught on fire even perhaps and they ran out and then you know the commotion or something mm -hmm. else may have you know was just enough to trigger that that slab avalanche to yeah. to come and then just kind of I mean, it's so easy to be up high up in the mountains and for an avalanche to trigger. I mean, or or maybe there was some sort of military testing or a loud sonic boom went off and it just caught like if you just, you know, that's why they throw dynamite at the side of the mountain to trigger avalanches is because oh, yeah. all it takes is like yeah. one little fucking thing. So it's maybe they were near testing a military weapons and boom, a, a big sound goes yeah, off and it possibly. triggers an avalanche and they're like, holy shit. Or they hear it like you can hear it like rumbling. Yeah. So maybe that's why they're like, oh, shit, get out, like cut open. And they yeah. all just took off. Could have been so close to them. They were like, fuck, we got to get out of here. Yeah. You know? it, yeah. It's it's interesting because they're all it seems like they were all like beelining it for the the tree. Line. Yeah. yeah. They're trying to get as far down the mountain as they could. And and they just didn't make it. And there was just no escape. And and, you know, they all died in different places. And and because of the movement of the snow or the terrain and. That's why we found them the way that we did. Yeah, that makes the most sense. But then again, I mean, it seems like, you know, it, Yuri Yudin, I mean, he believes that this was some type of cover up, some type of government cover up with the Russian military and that perhaps that, you know, they staged it to look like an avalanche or something happened. But in fact, this was like, you know, a killing or execution by the KGB. I mean, it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. That's for sure. So. Yeah. But, I mean, there's just so many things that could have happened. Yeah, for me on the alien theory, I just feel like that doesn't make much sense because you and I, we've covered lots of right. aliens. There's not anything else in here that screams aliens no. to me. And why would the aliens kill all the hikers? That just doesn't make any sense. I mean, most of the, t like from what we've seen, aliens are somewhat friendly. Like they're not going to kill you. They may experiment on you, but then they're they're going to get you back to, to safety. Yeah, I just feel like if it was something paranormal or you know, a uh, cryptid or something like that, we probably just wouldn't find them or we'd find pieces or we, you know, it there, I feel like that wouldn't have happened the way that it did. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the medical examiner was like hypothermia. So clearly there's enough evidence for him to do that. But at the same time, maybe the medical examiner didn't fully do a full autopsy and didn't actually like do all the due diligence to actually figure out, all of the injuries that happened. Yeah. I mean, there could be other things that just were missed or not noted. So, well, and that also makes me think like with the cryptids is the fact that there's all this radio activity going on, on that land. It does make me think of Skinwalker ranch on how, you know, possible shapeshifters are attracted to radioactive, you know, yeah, that's a good areas point. and stuff. That's a good so point, what if maybe. there was a shapeshifter maybe. werewolf style God. coming out? <laughs> maybe. I mean, who knows either way. I mean, Feel bad for these hikers yeah that this was the way yeah. they they were taken out of the world because god i mean seemed like a, a good group of friends and yeah very experienced hikers i mean that's the thing is they've done this before so why this time they just have uh, and again i mean it, you could look at experience hikers that hike mount everest or mm -hmm. all the tallest mountains i mean all it takes is that one time where the environmental factors are not in your favor and something happens out yeah. of your control. So, you know, I think as much as people are like, well, they're experienced and they would know not to camp where there would be an avalanche or something makes some sense. But at the same time, I mean, in a pinch, you're just going to put up camp wherever you can. Yeah. So I, I think it was just kind of a, a lot of bad luck, mm -hmm. honestly. And mother nature can be very unpredictable sometimes. Absolutely. So. And cruel. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you'll have to let us know what you think happened to the hikers on DLF Pass. I'd love to hear your thoughts and maybe other theories out there if they exist. 
But that is where we will wrap up today's episode. Hopefully you found this one intriguing because we sure did. This is definitely one of my favorite unsolved mysteries out there. I mean, I don't know if it'll ever be solved for sure. Every, you know, every couple of years so often I see an article is like, do y'all have past incidents solved or explained? And, you know, like it explains parts of it, but there's never been really like a full blown theory that explains every last detail to it. And I think that's what just, you know, makes it live on is that people are just always interested to look at it from different angles and different situations that might have unfolded. But definitely leave us uh, a like on YouTube if you're watching. Make sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. We'd really appreciate it. But we will see you guys next time. And until then, lights out. Everybody.